Hello. The topic for today is uh, David Hume's piece on identity. This is the last of our readings on personal identity, and it uh, is the reading that will finally explore the position that perhaps there's really no th such thing as, as personal identity. Uh, that's uh, certainly going to be David Hume's position, and you'll notice some parallels between uh, this position of Hume's uh, and other positions that we have read and, of course, will read later in the course. So, um, to lay things out, uh, here's what Hume has to do. If he wants to convince people that there really is no such thing as personal identity, what he has to do is he has to show, first of all, uh, that, uh, that there there is no such thing as personal identity. He has to give us an argument. He's got to convince us that it's in fact true that there is no real concept of personal identity. But the second thing he has to do is he has to be able to explain away why we think so very strongly that there is such a thing as personal identity. Uh, after all, you know, we say things like, uh, that's the chair I sat in yesterday, I had lunch at that place last week, that's me when I was eight, etc. Uh, we very much think that there is such a thing as personal identity, and if there isn't, uh, uh, Hume's got to convince us that that's the case, and also explain why we so very strongly thought there was. So he needs an argument and an explanation here in order to have a complete position. And so Hume's position is going to start this way. Uh, Hume is, is, is such a, a beautifully clear writer that and you'll notice an awful lot of the, the notes that we'll see here are simply pulled straight from the text. Uh, I can't really say what Hume mean, meant to say any better than Hume did, uh, but I can point you to some, some uh, uh, key passages here. And so one of those key passages is this. Uh, Hume says, we don't so much have an idea of self of the kind that is here described. From what impression could this idea be derived? Uh, he's here talking about this sense of the sense of self that people have, uh, the sense that people, uh, you know, you, you're you're conscious of of yourself, right? You know who you are, etc. All that sort of stuff. That's what he's 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 referring to. He says, this question can't be answered without obvious contradiction and absurdity, yet it must be answered if the idea of self is to qualify as clear and intelligible. Every real idea must arise from some one impression, but self or person is not any one impression, but is rather that to which our many impressions and ideas are supposed to be related. Right. So this is a, a statement of his basic position here. Uh, you know, again, you might think to yourself, how could it be anything but perfectly clear that we have a sense of the self, that we sort of know who we are at all points in our lives? Uh, well, this is, remember, he's an empiricist, right? He thinks if we have an idea, we have to get that idea in some sense from experience. And so he thinks we, we can get no such idea of the self from experience. Uh, and, and here's his argument. Uh, the argument starts off uh, with this kind of a claim, right? The claim is, if there is a self, then there should be an impression, right? Something we get from our senses that is constant and invariable, right? Uh, or at least not from our, uh, if not from our senses, then from experience. And remember the way that Locke described experience as both sensation, which does come from the senses, and reflection, that is our consciousness of our own mental states. Uh, you think, you know, well, surely we get a sense of self from that, but this is precisely what Hume denies. But I want to point out with this first idea, uh, this idea that if there is a self, then there should be an impression that's constant and invariable, uh, why he thinks so. Because, of course, if your self, if the person that you are, right, as in, you know, that you're identical with in that sense, if that persists all the way through your life, right, if you are the same person your whole life, okay, in, again, in the sense that you know, numerical identical, uh, of, of course, you change over time, that's not what he means. If you are, like, if you can point to a photograph, say, that's me when I was eight, right? If you say, I'm the same person then that I am now, in, in this philosophical sense, um, then that means that the self is unchanging, right? It, 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 and it persists all the way through your life, right? And when your self doesn't exist anymore, you're dead, okay? Before your self existed, you weren't born yet. Um, and, and so, but the whole rest of the time, it's constant and invariable, okay? Constant, because it's there all the time. Invariable, it doesn't change. You know, you, in, a sen in the sense of being you, uh, is not a thing that changes over time. 
And so this is then uh, the linchpin of, of Hume's argument, this idea that there just isn't any impression that is constant and invariable the way that the self would have to be if there were such a, a concept. So let me put it this way. When you feel pain, do you feel yourself and the pain or do you just feel the pain? Right? When you see a yellow flower, do you see yourself and the flower or do you just see the flower? Right? When you are angry, do you feel anger and yourself or do you just feel the anger? Right? And this is just a matter of, again, this will this will resemble a lot of Hume's prior arguments in the sense that he's asking you just to be very, very careful in, in paying attention to what you really do pick up from your senses or from experience and what you don't. Right. And so if the idea is like, well, no, I guess I don't feel myself and anger. I just feel anger. I don't feel myself and pain. I just feel pain. Uh, then you'll be going right along with Hume here. And to say, I think I think it's at least as far as I'm concerned, I, he's simply just right about this. Uh, I, I don't seem to have all this this sort of extra thing that's always the same throughout my life. I just have the impressions I have. I hear the things I hear. I see the things I see. I feel the things I feel. And I think the things I think. I, I'm not giving this lecture and like hearing myself and my words, right? I'm just hearing the words. Um, so that's yeah, the, 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 there, there is no extra uh, content here. And so, of course, he said, you know, he said, look, if there were a self, there would have to be some impression that's constant and variable. There isn't anything constant and variable. Therefore, there's no self. Uh, it's, a, it's as valid an argument as you could have. It follows the pattern known as modus tollens. You don't really need to know that, but that there, there it is. Okay, so uh, that's, that's Hume's argument. That's it. It's, it's, it's very brief. It's very straightforward. It's, I think, uh, pretty convincing. Of course, the rest of his account concerns the explanation, why he thinks that we really thought that there was some such thing as identity, if after all there isn't. And so Hume's explanation goes like this. He says, here are two mental acts. Number one, thinking about a series of related objects. And number two, thinking about one uninterrupted and invariable object. Clearly, there's a difference between these two. One of them is sameness. That's the, the, the mental act two is thinking about one uninterrupted and invariable object that is an object that is the same, right, over time. And then there's this uh, concept of relatedness, which is thinking of a whole series of objects that are related to one another. Notice sameness and relatedness are two different things, very clearly. Hume's point is that these two mental acts feel the same, right? It feels very similar to do one than the other. Uh, you might say something like, uh, you know, if he, he, he was to use today's parlance, he'd say something like, well, it's the same part of your brain that does one of these things that does the other of those things. Now, neurologically, I don't know. Uh, but I think that his his notice here uh, is, is pretty good. Uh, he notices a real similarity between these kind of things as mental activities. And I think what he's trying to get at is that it's going to be really easy to mistake one for the other or to, in a moment of, of, of a bit of laziness or a bit of inattention, slip from one into the other without quite realizing what we're doing. And he thinks that's what we do really all the time. Uh, he thinks that most of what we refer to as identity uh, is, is just, just a kind of lazy mistake in one way or, uh, or another. So then he, he proceeds to give a, 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 a further explanation. Here. Um, he says, thus, the controversy about identity is not a merely verbal dispute. For when we attribute identity in an improper sense to variable or interrupted objects, we are not just using words wrongly, but we are engaging in a fiction, a false thought. To convince a fair-minded person that this is so, we need only to show him through his own daily experience that when variable or interrupted objects are supposed to continue the same, they really consist only in a sequence of parts connected together by resemblance, contiguity, or causation. All right. So I think some examples uh, would serve to be uh, illustrative here. Uh, and, and Hume provides provides many, and I'll, I'll sort of provide some along the way. So uh, 
one of the kinds of ways that he thinks that we mistake relatedness for sameness uh, is when we look at the way that things do tend to change over time. Uh, so he puts it this way. He says, although a, lar a turnover in any large part of a mass of matter makes us unwilling to say that it continues to be the same thing, what we count as large in this context depends not on the actual size of the part, but rather on how big a proportion it is of the whole. We would count a planet as still the same if it acquired or lost a mountain, but the change of a few inches could destroy the identity of some bodies. The only way to explain this is by supposing that objects interrupt the continuity of the mind's actions, not according to their real size, but according to their proportion to each other. That leads us to say something that is they say something is the same when strictly speaking it is not the same. Right? And so this is uh, dealing with this notion of change over time. Some of these changes are radical enough that we say, oh, well, yes, the object is not the same anymore. Its identity has not been preserved. Uh, so imagine, again, you take a, a, the ship of Theseus and you drop a mountain on it, right? That, that's a pretty radical change. That's, a, you know, proportionally or otherwise, um, you know, you could take, you know, you take away, you know, half the boat and you say, well, now it's not the ship of Theseus anymore. Okay, so if you're taking a proportionally large change, we say, okay, well, it's not the same thing. But a, a, a proportionally small change, we sort of confuse something that's a lot like the other thing for being the same thing as the, the previous thing. Uh, and of course it isn't. If you take a whole mountain off of a planet, even though really strictly speaking, it, it's not it's not that noticeable uh, on the scale of planets. Uh, you know, we, we might be, you know, for example, if, if the moon got a new crater, would you really notice? Like if it's, you know, more or less same as most of the other craters? You know, I, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, maybe astronomers would eventually, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just one of those things where it is, there's so many already. Uh, and even though some of those the, the craters that you can actually see on the moon, look, you could see them all the way from here. That means they're really big. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's you know, we'd be tempted to say, ah, it's the same thing. You know, it's the same moon, just got a new crater on it. Whereas if we were to put that kind of a crater, say, in your yard, you want to say, ah, it's not the same yard. Um, and so again, this is this is a little funny, and, and Hume's essentially calling on uh, calling us on this inconsistency that we have. So you see this photograph here on the right. Uh, that's uh, if you look at a map, uh, like a, a geological map of, of uh, northeast Kansas, you'll notice that there's a little uh, there's a little marker there uh, uh, for a thing called Mount Sunflower. Um, and this is actually a photograph of uh, uh, if you you know took a picture of where that mark on the map was that is said to be Mount Sunflower. Uh, and this is what it looks like. And you'll notice that horizon looks about as flat as it's possible to be. This is very near the town of Goodland, Kansas, where uh, I lived for a period of time as a child. And I will tell you that uh, going sledding when there was snow was very interesting because there were really only two places to go. One was you could go to the uh, interstate overpass, right? The overpass they built over I-70. Um, and uh, you could slide down the side of that thing. It was sort of a, you know, a sort of a lesser road that went over the top of the interstate. And so you could uh, sled down the, the the side of the overpass, right? Because that was one of the hills in town. The other place you could go to sled was the big excavation, the big sort of hole uh, in the ground where they got all the dirt to build the overpass, uh, some, you know, a short distance away from it. So that's that's about it. The only two elevation changes near the entire town, and they're 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 man-made. Uh, so yeah, that's that that flat horizon is pretty typical of uh, of Western Kansas, uh, and so you'll notice it seems as if um, we are actually missing a mountain, right? I mean, where is it? You you know, it says it's on the map, and and here you go, it doesn't appear to be there. So um, it's not the same planet as it as it was before the mountain was I don't know vanished away. I don't know. There's a story there, I guess. So another example that Hume gives us of relatedness, he says. Although a change in any considerable part of a body destroys its identity, if the change is produced gradually and imperceptibly, we are less apt to see it as destroying the identity. The reason for this must be that the mind, in following the successive changes of the body, slides easily along from surveying its condition at one moment to surveying it at another, and it is never aware of any interruption in its actions. This is another case where if, if a change is gradual enough, if it's slow enough, we just don't notice it, right? Um, 
And that doesn't mean there isn't any change. It's just that we don't notice it, right? And so if you'll notice the uh, the animation over here, this is a, an animation of, uh, a, you know, a couple hundred million years of uh, continental drift, uh, you know, so you'll, you'll recognize the uh, sort of ending configuration and you probably don't recognize all that much any of these beginning configurations, although they start to look sort of more and more familiar as the thing goes on. Um, but it's not like con continental drift is a thing that only happened in the past. Um, I mean, continental drift is, is a continuing thing. Uh, it, it, you know, the continents continue to move. In fact, they move roughly at the same speed as your fingernails grow, which uh, you know that they grow, right? Uh, you know, this is one of those things, but it's not like you, you can't see it happening in, in as they say, real time. Uh, and so d just as so, you, you can't really observe the continents drifting in any obvious way. That doesn't mean they're not drifting. That doesn't mean things are not changing over time and becoming different, right? So again, this is where Hume is pointing to a set of mental habits, Right. We, he says that, that you know, we're apt to be fooled by the way that, that we are, right? Things that operate sort of on our own time scale uh, that change fast, uh, you know, compared to the way, compared to how fast we change, we notice. But things that change slowly compared to how fast we change, we, we don't tend to notice. Um, and that doesn't mean they don't change. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that they aren't different. That, that doesn't mean, you know, so there, there's all sorts of things here. Uh, again, he's pointing to, he's calling us on this sort of mental laziness that makes us say that we're thinking about the same thing over time when really you're, you're thinking of lots of different things that are just related to one another so for, for example lots of different states of, of of these continents that are just related to previous states of those continents or really anything else he continues he says but we have a device through which we can induce the imagination to go one step further in attributing identity where really there is none namely relating the parts to one another through some common end or purpose a ship of which a considerable part has been changed by frequent repairs is still considered the same even if the materials of which it is composed have come to be quite different through all the variations of the parts they still serve the same common purpose and that makes it easy for the imagination to move from the ship before the repairs to the ship after so here he's just talking about the ship of theseus which i have a little picture of here on the side of some greek vase and in fact i don't know if that's supposed to be the ship of theseus on that vase but it's an ancient greek picture of a ship and uh, uh theseus was an ancient greek so well myth you know uh, legendarily he was an ancient greek so uh in any case yeah, he's talking about the ship of Theseus here, the standby example. Um, and again, because he says, because all of the parts of the ship are related to one another as being part of the same purpose that is making up a ship, we tend to just say, when you change out the parts, that it's the same ship because it's doing the same thing it was doing before, when in fact, it's not the same right? So again, there's a, this sense of, of mental laziness uh, that's going on that, that he calls us on. He continues, as if more examples are even needed here, he says, uh, this happens even more strikingly when we see the parts as being causally related to one another in everything they do, in ways that reflect their common end. This is not the case with ships, but it is the case with all animals and vegetables. Not only are the parts taken to have some overall purpose, but also they depend on and are connected with one another in ways that further that purpose. The effect of this relation is that although in a very few years, both plants and animals go through a total change with their form, size, and substance being entirely alerted, yet we still attribute identity to them. Uh, this is just a, a bit of an irony. If you can hear something that sounds like water uh, or, or, for example, a dog drinking a bowl of water, that's exactly what that is. It's a dog drinking a bowl of water. In fact, it's my dog drinking a bowl of water just as we get to the slide with the pictures of the dogs on them. So bear with me on that one. So in any case, you'll notice these are several different pictures, um, and you'll notice that they seem to be at different life stages than in, you know of a, of a dog, right? You've got a, you've got a little puppy there, you've got a slightly larger puppy, and then you've got a couple pictures of adult dogs at the bottom, and of course, they're not the same, right? You know, even if you want to say, well, oh, that's my dog when it was a puppy, and that's my dog when it was a little older. In fact, actually, there are, in all likelihood, uh, 
three dogs in these these four photographs different dogs um i didn't actually i didn't have my dog as a, as a puppy the two on the, the the bottom there those are actually uh those are actually my dog uh the 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 upper two i found on the internet because they sort of looked kind of like my dog uh, at, at a much uh, younger age that of course i again it's it's possible that i happen to get lucky and just google the image uh that actually corresponds to my actual dog that somehow ended up uh in a in a shelter and then i then i got her but very very doubtful in fact the, the two on the top come from two different google sites and so again i, I very much doubt they're those two on the top are even the same dog as each other much less uh, uh being the same they're not the same dog as the dog below um but even if right uh, even if i had a picture of my dog when she was a puppy it's not the same dog, right? It's changed since then, right? Now, again, all of her parts work together. You know, the you know they got the feet and the ears and the the heart and the lungs and you know all the muscles and sinews and tissues and they all work together. They're all causally related, but that doesn't mean that as they change over time, they don't change over time. They don't become something different over over the time. Um, this is this is the way things work. My own body changes over time. I do not have the body I was born with. Uh, it is different. I am different, right? So, there, you know, when I point to a photograph of myself when I was, you know, an infant, I, I can't really say that's me um, because we have nothing in common except for certain things that we might imagine to be relevant to identity, but, you know, two different objects. Right. Hume continues. When an old brick church fell to ruin, we may say that the parish rebuilt the same church out of sandstone and in a modern architectural style. Here, neither the form nor the materials are the same. The buildings have nothing in common except their relation to the inhabitants of the parish. And yet this alone is enough to make us call them the same. So in the photos, we see uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, uh, uh, the old one that uh, was uh, destroyed in the fire of London, and then the new one that was uh, designed by Sir Christopher Wren. Uh, and of course, some work's been done on that one in that particular photograph because it took some damage in World War II as well um, and uh, had, to, had to be sort of refurbished in a sense. Um, but uh, but it'll, by and large, it, uh, it stands. Um, and so uh, again, this is this is this rebuilding was done, you know, in more or less living memory in Hume's day, uh, and so uh, maybe that was something that he had in mind here. Uh, but again, to, in what sense is Saint Paul's Cathedral the same church as the old Saint Paul's Cathedral? Well, I mean, uh, well, only in the sense that we sort of call it the same, or there's a kind of naming a continuity. But there's no real continuity. There's an old building; it's gone, it's destroyed, uh, and and the new one is is a different building. Um, and he continues even more as if uh, we need him to really, I mean, he really beats on this one. Um, because again, he's trying to get loose an idea that's that's just very, very, very entrenched. And so uh, if, if he's gonna do that, he's gonna have to really beat on it. Uh, and so he continues, he says, the nature of a river consists in the motion and change of parts so that there is a total turnover of these in less than a day but this does not stop the river from being, quote unquote, the same for centuries. What is natural and essential to a thing is expected. And what is expected makes less impression and appears less significant than what is unusual and extraordinary. A big change of an expected kind looks smaller to the imagination than the most trivial unexpected alteration. And by making less of a break in the continuity of the thought, it has less influence in destroying the supposition of identity. This is very important language in this, in this bit here. Notice what Hume is doing. He says, look, whenever we get things that we sort of expect or that are familiar in the way that they continue and change over time, we tend to think that they don't in fact change over time, that they still remain the same. So even though, again, the river completely changes in less than a day, uh, we can still call it the same river for centuries. Um, so in fact, this picture here is the Blue River. Uh, although I could, you could be forgiven for not uh, uh, immediately knowing that. Just looking at the thing, uh, it's not particularly 
blue. Um, and so this is actually one of the nicer sort of uh, areas of the Blue River I've seen. Most of the most, if you look at you know, a lot closer to the city, it's even sort of muckier and you know not have quite so much even pretty vegetation on on both sides. So this is a pretty pretty good picture of, of the blue. Uh, anyway, uh, what, what Hume's uh, saying here is that you know he's saying something that's very very similar to the kinds of ideas that he gave us in the epistemology unit, where he talked about causation, uh, this this notion of, of one thing causing another, uh, that really it's a kind of mental habit where we just sort of associate one thing with another. And and here, I think he's, he's making a very similar move. He's saying that we have all of these different things, but if they're similar in a way that we're used to, we're liable to just miss the fact that it's changing, that it's not the same over time, uh, and 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 thus to think of it as being, uh, you know, part of the same object, right? So uh, we're we're confusing those two mental acts again, thinking of a series of related objects rather than thinking about one constant and invariable object, right? Since those two mental activities feel so similar, we often just confuse one for the other. And we especially do that when things uh, sort of fit our expectations. When things break our expectations, well, then then we notice it. But uh, until that happens, we don't. And if that's really all that's sitting behind our concept of identity, it's probably not a very good concept. It's probably not, as he says, a real idea. Right. So uh, uh, notice we've been talking mostly about objects, right? Uh, some, you know, animals, plants, things like that. Uh, he says, I now proceed to explain the nature of personal identity, which has become such a great issue in philosophy. The line of reasoning that has so successfully explained the identity of plants and animals, of ships and houses, and of all changing complex things, natural and artificial, must be applied to personal identity too. The identity that we ascribe to the mind of man is fictitious. It is like the identity we ascribe to plants and animals. So it can't have a different origin from the latter, but must come from a similar operation of the imagination on similar objects. Again, he says this is a kind of a mental habit. We sort of imagine a connection over time or imagine something constant and, and invariable, uh, but there's no actual real thing that is there. There's no actual self that is constant and invariable over time. And so uh, he gives us a, a bit of an explanation in the case of, of mental activities, the human mind. He says, let us take resemblance first. If someone always remembers a large proportion of his past perceptions, this will contribute greatly to the holding of a certain relation within the sequence of his perception, varied as they may be. Uh, so what he's saying here is that there's a resemblance Right, you, that a lot of your experiences are much like many of your other experiences. There, there, there's some similar qualities involved with all of those different experiences, but they are different experiences the whole way through. And so, uh, because there, there's something similar about many of them. Again, we tend to think of them as just sort of being part of a kind of sameness, right? A kind of self or something like that. Uh, and, and, and of course, he points out that they can't be, right? All of, you know, turn your eyes in your socket and you're going to get a, a completely different set of inputs, a completely different set of impressions and experiences, you know, uh, uh, from, from the other. And it never, you never get back what you had, right? Uh, thinking back on something isn't the same thing as the first time you were thinking about it. It's just, um, it's the, the, this is sort of ever flowing, ever changing present that you never really do get back or return to. And he continues, he says, causation also has a role. The true idea of the human mind is the idea of a system of different perceptions that are linked by the cause-effect relation through which they mutually produce, destroy, influence, and modify each other. So again, because our different mental states are causally related to one another, that is some of the, you know, the earlier ones cause the later ones, uh, the, you know, there's the, that's why they call sort of a train of thought, is because there's a kind of causal relation between them, uh, we assume that they must be part of a kind of continuing single thing. Again, we mistake thinking of a series of related objects, that is, uh, related mental states and thinking of one continuous and uninterrupted thing. We don't have one continuous and uninterrupted mental state. We have lots of them that are related to each other, but that doesn't make them part of uh, some kind of sameness with each other. They are all different. All of our different ideas are all different ideas. 
And then uh, finally, uh, Hume uh, uh, looks at the concept of memory. Uh, and this is uh, because one of his uh, immediate predecessors, uh, John Locke, who's uh, in a sense he's responding to here, remember Locke's theory of identity is that people simply are their memories. Uh, this was the view that was uh, 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 examined by uh, by John Perry in his dialogue, uh, specifically The Second Night, uh, and was also uh, examined by Terence Pendlehume in his uh, article. Uh, but Hume here gives a different uh, objection to, to either of those two. Uh, those two give, I think, a more thorough objection. Uh, Hume just points out something he thinks is a little funny about, uh, about the, the very idea that we are our memories. He said this, if we had no memory, we would never have any notion of causation or consequently of the chain of causes and effects that constitute our self or person. Uh, again, remembering a mental state isn't having that mental state all over again. So again, we're looking at two related ideas, one having a mental state, the other having a memory of that mental state, right? And so again, these are differences over time, not samenesses over time. Uh, but he points out correctly, how many of our past actions do we actually remember? Who can tell me, for instance, what he thought and did on the 1st of January, 1715, the 11th of March, 1719, uh, and the 3rd of August, 1733? Now, of course, change those years to years in which you are actually alive, and I think you'll probably get the point. He says, or... Will he overturn all the most established notions of personal identity by saying that he has forgotten the incidents of those days? His uh, present self is not the same person as the self of that time. And he later asks, uh, really, if, if memory is identity, how little we really are. Uh, how do we extend our identity beyond our memory as we are very much want to do? Uh, again, he thinks this is a, a, the, this is an activity of the imagination. We don't have a real idea of identity. Identity is not a real thing for us. Uh, what it is is a thing that we kind of imagine because we're kind of used to it. And we sort of imagine when we think about our own mental states, when we sort of remember one, then the other, then the other, or notice that our, our mental states are, are uh, causally related to another or that they resemble one another. We see this relatedness and sort of think of it as sameness when when we're a little bit pickier about it, we can see that it isn't, right? And so that's that's Hume's argument. That's uh, or that's his explanation rather, uh, and that's Hume's entire account, right? Remember, he gives us uh, an idea about an argument. He says, look, if if you're supposed to have a self, you should notice something that's always with you. That's something that's completely unchanging in all of your perceptions. Um, that that's you know invariable and it's there the whole time. And you know he says, I don't notice any such thing. Nobody I've ever talked to notices any such thing. So there's his argument. And then of course his explanation is that there's two different kinds of mental activities. One is thinking of a series of related things, and two is thinking of some same thing over time. And this relatedness and the sameness are not the same thing, but they sort of feel the same. And it's really easy to kind of lazily confuse one for the other. And that's what we really do when we uh, attribute identity to all kinds of things, you know, churches and sounds and uh, animals and plants and people, for example. And so uh, that's, that's Hume's account. That's his uh, argument and his explanation for why there really is no such thing as personal identity.